And we are live with Brad Thompson. Brad, how are you this morning? Great. How are you doing? Our analytics tell us that when we start out with that digital front piece, we get more uh, watchers and listeners, strangely enough. <laughs> people like people like huh. people like shiny graphics in the beginning, apparently. Very cool. Yeah. So, um, Brad, we're here today uh, to talk about RPA, robotic process automation. Um, and, and maybe just tell me a little bit about your day-to-day -day job. It sounds like you are doing RPA or is that something you guys are going to be doing or what's tell, tell, tell us the listener a little bit about you. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, I run what's called the arts team, which is the automation reengineering transformation services team. And RPA is one of the tools we can utilize to help teams become more efficient and operationally effective. So RPA is, you know, robotic process automation, which is essentially like creating virtual employees. In in how long have you been using RPA? Is it is it been something you've you've just started to use or you've been using it for a while? Yeah, I feel like I've been using it for a while, but it's actually almost exactly 2 years ago uh, I was introduced to RPA and in researching what it could do and how it could change uh, healthcare, uh, I kind of went all in on what it could do for uh, health partners to improve operational efficiency. Is that primarily how it's used as operations? Is that the, the number one use case for it currently? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of its best uses. I mean, in IT, you generally have solutions available to you that you can utilize to, you know, um, you know, integrate with other systems. But what we found is IT actually has uh, some use cases that are very viable. When you have a system that you cannot integrate with, maybe there's a 30 year old system with a brand new technology and they spend a lot of time um, just trying to get those systems to talk to each other. Um, oftentimes they'll actually employ humans to port the data from one system to the next. And what we found is, you know, let's not try to make them integrate. Let's just create an RPA process to emulate what the humans are doing to do that much faster with no errors. Um, so generally we target operations, but there's been a lot of IT applications also. That's extremely interesting. So, so the, there, there is the technology is mature enough at this point where you're using it to, to port data to click. Can it, can it do data cleansing? I mean, can you, if you have data cleansing issues, can you yeah. use RPA for, yeah, absolutely. for that? I mean, the reason why it's so powerful is because I don't know if you're uh, aware of a product called Selenium. They used to use it for um, testing and validation. RPA is kind of like Selenium on steroids where it can, um, it can go and make selections like a human would, but even better than Selenium is that they have what they call connectors. So it can make a call. So say the process is, I want to send an email. Microsoft creates a way to make a call under the covers to send an email. So it's always accurate. It's always correct. And then within the RPA process, you can call, you can utilize any other software. You can, you know, make an API request. You can uh, create a decision tree uh, to make choices like a human would. You can scrape a screen. Um, so it can do so many other things within the robot package. It's interesting that you mentioned Selenium. In your mind, is our testers or testers that have been using Selenium and some of those products that we're moving towards automated process, are they ideal people to jump into a tool like RPA for, for a resource? Yeah, yeah. That's the other division that uses RPA um, at Health Partners is our testing teams. They They are utilizing a product called test suite to then use RPA products to just do more rich testing, uh, more sophisticated testing. How does RPA use or compete or work alongside with chat GPT? Because some of the things you've mentioned to me seem like areas that some groups that I talk to are trying to use chat GPT for. 
So do they work together? Are they competitive mm -hmm. competing technologies? How do you view that? No, they're more of a, they're more similar than competing. Um, there are like uh, connectors where you can actually reach out to ChatGPT within your bots. Um, so that's an option. But what we use kind of more of AI just in general for is um, we want to train the bot to uh, use kind of a sophisticated OCR to pull, like, say, an invoice, pull the information from an invoice. But then we want to use machine learning to train it that, you know, this vendor may have their name here or maybe it's in a logo, but they're remit to maybe on the top or on the bottom. And you want to train the model so that it can go and look at any invoice and pull all the needed information to pay the invoice um, by training the model over time. And it can just figure it out for itself. I know that usually when I see remit to, I will see maybe a name, maybe not, maybe an address, you know, like this is what I'm looking for. And after it trains on, you know, so many hundreds of documents, it starts to, you know, learn, I guess, as they would say, how to pull that information, no matter what the uh, the the format is on the actual invoice from a vendor. And what happens because vendors oftentimes will make a switch for no apparent reason with the placement of their data, you know, for a system changes all of a sudden a location, maybe even sometimes key numbers will change uh, within a document. Does Does the RPA recognize that and it's able to work through it at this point that's the goal is to train the model so that it can look for you know uh the logical uh patterns that it would say the information is generally here i didn't find it here because it doesn't necessarily train on like this is this specific invoice it's just here's invoices and here's the patterns i'll find to get this type of information um but again, with RPA and the way we design our bots is that if it ever, if it fails, there's always that out where it says, send this to a human. And the, the reason why it's powerful is you can create an attended process where it goes through and pulls all the information you need. And maybe it fails at a point and then it brings it to a, uh, a software process for a human where they have a queue and it says, I can't figure this piece out. And it might show them the screen or the whole invoice and they'll say, can you correct this one piece? And the human can say, oh, I see what they did. They did it here. They not only select and say, here's what you're looking for. That will retrain the model, but it'll pick up exactly where that process stopped. So it did the 10 things and it needed to finish 20, but it stopped at, you know, item number 11. The human corrects 11 and then it continues on the path and processes the rest. So even if you can't do a fully unattended process, you can create an attended process that reduces the time a human would need to be involved, which makes them much more efficient. Yeah. You you may not know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it because I'm curious. How many humans, like in a in an area, an organization the size of yours, how many humans are sitting in a back room somewhere that are dealing with errors? Is it is it 20? Is it 15? Is it 40? Do you know? Oh, Right now, um, zero. Oh. And that is because, uh, so last year, about one year ago, we had seven bots. And now we have over 80. And we, had, we took the approach that create the bots and get value and benefit from them. Um, but if we have an exception, document everything that went wrong to tell the human, here's why I couldn't process this. And a lot of times it was because this use case isn't valid. This is a problematic, you know, uh, process. So a human would have to look at it and do X, Y, and Z, but we give them all that data and then we process everything that can go clean. So the humans who were doing the process before just take the exceptions and sort those out. So we can spin them up, them up quickly and get 80, 90% value. Um, and then use real world scenarios to improve them. Um, and so we don't have any humans sitting around clicking through. Now, I think we will because we're going to be doing some other um, processes soon. But you really take the humans who are battling these processes day to day, all day long, and you say, hey, every morning, do this for 10 minutes. You know, that's what the idea is. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Um, so 
what you're telling me leads me to to my final question for you. Will these bots at some point and or chat GPT, is there a time coming soon where they'll replace developers and, you know, QA people, uh, you know, in, in 10 years or 20 years, in your opinion, where do you see that going? I mean, I think in 20 years, we can't even imagine what this is going to be like. Um, and, you know, the reason why this one's a little more difficult to just use chat GPT is because within one process, you might be calling uh, seven different products. And those products need to know how to uh, work with each other. And that's what the developers do. So it's a little bit more difficult, especially when you're using proprietary systems. But just based on what I've seen with AI's capabilities now, I mean, I don't even think we can predict how this will work. And, you know, I'm hoping this come this turns into the, you know, four-day work week, week three-day work week, you know, like, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not hoping for the idiocracy. Uh, and and product here but you know something just more manageable for humans and you know right now what i see this product as doing is just to give you kind of numbers why it's powerful in the last year we've completed over 500,000 tasks for the employees of health partners that's 500,000 distractions that take between 1 minute and 2 hours to complete and can you imagine going through your day and not having 50 distractions I take you away from the real work you want to do. Yeah, it's it's it sounds like a very powerful tool and and exciting. Um, Brad Thompson, thanks so much for your time. Uh, you got some great stuff going on there at Health Partners. For everyone else out there, you're watching the vodcast. Thanks, Brad. some luck and leave the god forsaken snow singing old john denver songs with his little dog barking along flying like an eagle down the open road said goodbye to everything he ever knew just his little dog and fishing pole Single and strong, and out there on the open road. For forty years he broke his back, left his landlady with his pension check, and said a little. He will bitch about the government and how tax money's spent. But still, he bleeds red, white, and blue. He spent his last dollars on a new tattoo, a cold case of Miller and a bag of screw. That covers everything he needs. He wouldn't say he's all about it on his own. A man must walk this world alone. Sixty single and stoned. He went flying like an eagle down the open road. Said goodbye to everything he ever knowed. Just his little dog and fishing pole. Glad to hear this mother eating India. But happy to be living in America. Sixty single and stoned. And out there on Trying to make his way